second chapter, entitled Contents of the Gita Sunrise. So we are answering this third question. What is the mentality when the senses are controlled? And we're going to see today Krishna is speaking for the first time directly about bhakti. He has hinted at it so far. He has alluded to it. But this is the first verse that he is speaking directly about bhakti, which means devotional service to Krishna. So we'll see that. Um, here. So the key theme in this section again 
for review and repetition and over and over again. What is our key theme for this section? Controlling the senses. And controlling senses does not mean... So we can move forward. We have understood, right? Controlling the senses means to engage the senses very intelligently. And we said that the art of mind control, finding peace, finding stability, perseverance through ups and downs, we must begin to see things as they are. And that means seeing through everything that we face through the lens, I am spirit soul. I am not this body. And we're going to see in the story we'll discuss today, this is an extraordinarily vivid example of how such consciousness compares to someone who is not seeing things from the perspective, I am spirit soul. Because when somebody insults me and says, you are ugly, my feelings are hurt. But if I remember, I am not this body. I am spirit soul. Then those words are not as painful. Because they're referring to something that I am not. This body. But if I think I am this body, then that which the body faces, either insults, difficulties, happiness, distress, it affects my consciousness. Right? So, we must see everything through this lens, I am spirit soul. And anytime we become troubled, if we just take a moment and say, I'm a spirit soul, how should I think about this? You'll find great power in being able to make sense and make peace with some of the things that will trouble us. So he said controlling the mind means to not let it control us. Meaning, being peaceful. Being thoughtful, not erratic. Having uh, a sense of purpose which is not deviated by all kinds of ideas. These are some of the definitions we had of a controlled mind. And so he said there are two ways to control the mind. One is an inactive process. Just try to stop the mind. Mind you, be quiet. And this process is jnana yoga. Detaching from our senses from all matter. I'm not going to eat pizza, I'm not going to watch this, I'm not going to do that, I'm not, no more red shirt, no, detaching. But what is the problem with that? What is the challenge with that? It's temporary. It's temporary. Because eventually, our taste for those things will pull us right back. Any other challenges with this approach, this inactive approach? It's sucky. <laughs> it's sucky. <laughs> it's no fun. <laughs> it's no fun. Right? We detach from all these things, but we haven't replaced it with something better. So the replacement process, that is the active process, and that is bhakti. By bhakti yoga, we are adding activities that are sweeter, that are better tasting, and thus we naturally re release from all of these lesser things. So in practicing bhakti, automatically the results of this inactive path are achieved. So, just like if I have a handful of sand and someone offers me some diamonds, to accept those diamonds, I have to let go of the sand and accept the diamonds. So by accepting the diamonds, I'm automatically letting go of that sand. Similarly, by accepting the process of bhakti, all these lesser things go. So this higher taste to an active process is the more better, longer term, and enjoyable process to control the mind. And we're going to see this in spades today. So let's, uh, we'll read the verse, and then we'll talk a little bit about bhakti, and then we'll do so. Someone wants to read the verse? Ami. Tani sarvani samyamya yukta asita mata praha. Vashihi yasha indriyani tasya prajana pratisutaha. One who restrains his senses, keeping them 
under full control and fixes his consciousness upon me is known as a man of steady intelligence Prefer? The four, the, that the highest conception of yoga perfection is Krishna consciousness is clearly explained in this verse and unless one in Krishna consciousness it is not at all possible to control the senses as cited above the great sage Dhruvasha Muni picked up a quarrel with Maharaj Am Amresha and Dhruvasha Muni unnecessarily became angry out of pride and therefore could not check his senses on the other hand, the king, although not as powerful a yogi as a sage, but a devotee of the Lord, silently tolerated all the sage injustices and thereby emerged victorious. The king was able to control his senses because of the following qualification, as mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam. King Ambisha fixed his mind on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, engaged his words in describing the abode of the Lord his hands in fencing the temple of the Lord, his ears in hearing the past names of the Lord, his eyes in seeing the form of the Lord, his body in touching the body of the devotee, his nostrils in smelling the flower of the flowers offered to the lotus feet of the Lord, his tongue is tasting the tulasi leaves offered to him, his leg in traveling to the holy place where his temple is situated. His head in offering obeisances unto the Lord, his desire in fulfilling the desires of the Lord, and all these qualifications made him fit to become a Matpara devotee of the Lord. The word Matpara is most significant in this connection. How one can become Matpara is described in the life of Maharaj Ambrisha. Sri Baladev Vidya Bhushana, a great scholar and acharya in the line of Matpara, remarks. Mat Bhakti Prabha Vena Sarvendriya Vijaya Ojika Swatma Pristi Sul Naveti Bhavaha. The senses can complete can be completely controlled only by the strength of devotional service to Krishna. Also, the example of fire is sometimes given. As a blazing fire burns everything within a room, Lord Vishnu, situated in the heart of the yogi, burns up all kinds of impurities. The Yoga Sutra also prescribes meditation on Vishnu and not meditation on the world. The so-called yogis who meditate on something other than the Vishnu form simply waste their time in a vein, search after some phantasmagoria. We have to become Krishna consciousness devoted to the personality of Godhead. This is the aim of the real yoga. Okay. So as I mentioned in the opening, that this is Krishna's first direct discussion on bhakti. So bhakti means fixing our consciousness upon Krishna, meaning our whole consciousness is focused on one thing, and that is pleasing Krishna. A matparaha devotee. Prabhupada explains, they have one goal. And their only goal is to please Krishna. And it is a very high position. And we're going to see in the story of Ambarish Maharaj from Srimad Bhagavatam how Krishna feels about such a devotee. And it will surprise you. You will be surprised to hear how Krishna himself speaks about such a devotee. So, bhakti means love. Krishna, Prabhupada, excuse me, translates bhakti as devotional service. Devotion means our love. And service is an expression of our love. If we love someone, we render some service to them. I can say I love you. But if I render service, it is an even greater expression. So bhakti is the rendering of service. Hence, it is active. It is the performance of activities. 
as an expression of our love for Krishna. That is bhakti yoga. So it is very practical. As we see Maharaj Ambarish, how is he performing devotional service? He used to call his name. He used to call his name with the, his mouth. Yeah. What else? Fixed his obeisances. Fixed his mind. Paying obeisances. Paid obeisances. Quiet. Listening to the bhajans. Listening to the bhajans. Yeah, all of these are listed in this purple, right? Well, what does the one mean that she said? Offering obeisances, yeah. like offering our, 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 our like bowing to the Lord. Oh. So he says, I use my head as a means to offer my respects to the Lord. He uses his hands to clean the temple. He uses his nose to smell the tulsi leaves and flowers offered to the Lord. He uses his words to speak about Krishna. He uses the hearing, his ears to hear about Krishna and his devotees. And like this, all his different senses are engaged. Very practically. And thus, he is qualified, as Prabhupada said, to become a very top-class devotee. So we may wonder, what is the benefit of becoming such a top-class devotee? And this story of Maharaj Ambarish will really convince us of the potency of bhakti. So we'll discuss that. Now, Prabhupada says, the highest conception of yoga perfection is Krishna consciousness. And is explained clearly in this verse. And then he says, unless one is Krishna consciousness, it is not at all possible to control the senses. As we said, we may be able to control them for a short period of time. But unless we elevate our tastes, eventually those restrictions will fall back. It's just like those diets. Yeah. We fall back to the old habits. So controlling the senses is very difficult, is it not? So if I had this very fancy vehicle, a nice car, and I said, I need you to lift this car, I cannot lift it. It's very difficult. It's too heavy. Look at all this machinery. I can drive it, but I cannot lift this car. It's impossible. But if then I brought forward a little jack, and I said, now you lift this car. Can you lift it? How many hands? Even one hand. You can very easily lift it. So controlling the senses is very difficult. But with the power of bhakti, it becomes very simple. Very doable. Very practical. So to accomplish something extraordinary, we need the right tool, the right piece of equipment. We have to use our intelligence. And not just try to lift, do some extra push-ups, and think, okay, tomorrow, no, that is fruitless. So similarly, to control our senses, this process of devotional service is the only way to do it. So, we are going to now discuss a very powerful story and pastime that takes place in our history. And it's discussed here in the ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is a glorious, there are 18 such volumes. And it is filled with pastimes. But the pastimes are not just for Thursday night entertainment. Like our favorite sitcom or drama series. Yes, there is some intrigue in these pastimes. But within it are some very powerful lessons, morals that we can apply in our day-to-day -day life. So we'll discuss the pastime, and then we want, we'll do a little bit of analysis of the story, if that's okay? To really pull out its essence. And what we'll see here is how one, the power of bhakti, we'll see. We'll see how bhakti compares to the jnana yogi process. 
and we'll see how Krishna responds to his devotee. And that will really blow your mind. So this is explained in the ninth canto in the fourth chapter. And there was a, a great king by the name of Ambarish Maharaj. He was the son of Nabhag Maharaj. And Ambarish Maharaj was a very powerful king. How powerful? He had rule over Saptadvi, all seven islands. The whole planet was under his rule. Now you can imagine how much power it would take just to rule one small home or city or country, the whole world he was ruling. He was a very, very powerful king. But he was completely detached from that power. He had un unlimited wealth. The whole world was his wealth, his treasury. Because why was he detached? Because he was fully attached to Krishna. He was a pure devotee of the Lord, as we just read, serving a king, sweeping the floor of the temple. Offering his respects, singing about the Lord, and so on. So Ambarish Maharaj had great, great qualification. And what made him extraordinary as a leader was he understood the source of his power, the source of his ability to rule, the source of his position. He knew. Where it came from. Where did it come from? Krishna. And so he utilized all of that in the service of Krishna. So devotional service doesn't mean we abandon our duties. No, Ambarish Maharaj was serving as a king. But with full consciousness of his position as part and parcel of Krishna. So everything he did... He did as a service to Krishna. His ruling was not to, for his own ego to enjoy. But it was a service to Krishna. And we'll discuss more about his qualities. So Ambarish Maharaj was a very saintly king, as I said, a devotee of the Lord. And so he would do many things for the betterment of his citizens. A king has one goal. And that is to bring peace and prosperity to their kingdom. And Ambrish Maharaj, ruling on the principles of Shastra, was overseeing a perfect system. And he would perform very many sacrifices, yajyas, ashaveda sacrifices. And he would, you know, bring great brahmanas to perform these yajyas, he would distribute charity, he would sumptuously offer prasadam to everyone. In this way, he was following all the nice rules and regulations for ruling. So at one point, he decided that he wanted to perform a vrata, a, a, a fast, a vow, and he decided to follow the, the grain fast of Ekadashi. But not in any ordinary way, he followed it for one entire year. Full fast. Now we cannot imitate such thing. This is a very powerful personality. But you see, and why he performed that fast? For the pleasure of Krishna. And for the benefit of all of the residents of his kingdom. Not for his own benefit. So he and his wife, his queen, they both began to perform a very intense austerity, which is to fast for one whole calendar year. And this Ekadashi Vrat is very, very important for us. We follow it every two weeks or so. It's coming this Saturday, where we fast from grains. And it's considered a very powerful part of our devotional service. And taking some austerity, one is rewarded with great progress in their devotional life. So Ambarish Maharaj, desiring the, his kingdom to be benefited by this tapasya, began to perform this vrata. 
And on Ekadashi, the next day is called Dwadashi. And on that day, there's a specific time in which you are to break your fast also. So to complete the cycle of a fast, you break it the following day. And there's, based on the calendar, there's a prescribed time. So if you look on our calendar, on Sunday it'll say break between you know, this time and this time. Usually three, four hours are given, sometimes very short. But in that time, you break the fast, and that completes the vrata. So this time was coming. And so Ambarish Maharaj had performed a great abhishek, invited wonderful brahmanas, and he had distributed prasad to everybody. That is the, the saintly king way. He first served all of the great persons. And then he was ready to honor his prasad and to break his fast. And as he was about to do so, a great sage by the name of Durvasa Muni came to the assembly. Now, Durvasa Muni has a storied history, as many of you know. And this just adds to his legacy, the story. So Durvasa Muni came, so Amrish Maharaj said, Oh, Durvasa Muni, come, please sit and honor Prasad. He was very grateful that another great person had come unannounced to his assembly. And so you can imagine if we had been fasting for one year and somebody came just before we were about to eat, <laughs> how we would receive that person? <laughs> we would not answer the door. <laughs> we would turn off the cell phones. But Amrish Maharaj was very pleased to be able to serve one more person. This is the characteristic of a devotee. So Durvasa Muni gladly accepted, but he said, I must take bath for honoring Prasad, that is the etiquette. So he went to the river, but he took some time, some extra time. And now this time in which Ambarish Maharaj had to break his fast was finishing. He yeah, remember, he has to break it between a certain time. And there were only a few moments left in order to... And had he not broken it, the whole fast would have been ruined. And the offering to Krishna and to all of the citizens would have been lost. So as any intelligent devotee does, he consulted with his advisors. Not Google or some <laughs> paid-off politician but very learned brahmanas. And he discussed with them what to do. It is, I don't want to cross the etiquette of eating before my guest has eaten. That is not good etiquette. But if I don't eat and break my fast, everyone will lose the benefit of this vrata. He was not worried about his personal situation. So they discussed and he said, well, how about if I take some ashman, one drop of water in my hand, in honor, that is considered from Shastra as eating, but also not eating. So he consulted, which again shows us, how do we make decisions in our spiritual life? If we let the whimsical mind decide, all kinds of ideas will come. So we must consult those who know. And Ambarish Maharaj did so, though being a very powerful king. And so he honored. He took a small drop of water. And thus... His fast was considered complete, yet he had not crossed the etiquette of having honored Prasad, a very elegant and lovely solution to his dilemma. So he waited very patiently for Durvasa Muni to return. After some time, Durvasa Muni returned. Now Durvasa Muni, being a very you know, powerful mystic yogi, he could understand what Ambarish Maharaj had done. So Durvasa Muni became very, very angry. He said, who do you think you are? You are puffed up with pride because you are some king that you have not followed the proper etiquette and you have taken your food before me. Though he had not taken food, he had taken a drop of water to complete the vrata. Durvasa Muni could not tolerate such an insult. 
No, it was very whimsical and soft. And so he became fiery mad, very angry. And exhibiting his mystic powers, he plucked some hairs from his head. I don't have such powers. <laughs> but he plucked some hairs from his head. And he threw and he invoked a ferocious, fiery demon. This, this is a demon. This is Durvasa Muni. This is Ambarish Maharaj. A very fiery demon carrying a trishul, a trident, and was ready to attack Ambarish Maharaj. As Durvasa Muni said, you must be punished for such a transgression. Wow. And Ambarish Maharaj, hearing this, seeing this ferocious, fiery demon, how he responded. Didn't flinch. This demon charged at him. Didn't bat an eye. Nothing. At peace. And what happened? Krishna sent his Sudarshana Chakra. And the Sudarshan Chakra immediately vanquished the demon. And he was gone. In an instant. Now this chakra then had a second target in his mind. And who was that? Durvasa Muni. Muni saw the chakra coming at him and he began to run. He was a very powerful mystic, so he can run, not like we run. He can run to other planetary systems. He has these mystic powers. So he began to run and the chakra was just on the back of his neck, burning hot heat. And he tried to find shelter in a cave, in a mountain, in the ocean, went to the higher heavenly planets, went everywhere. Nowhere could he get away from this very powerful chakra. Finally, finding no place to go shelter, he decided... I shall go see Lord Brahma. Maybe he can help me. So he goes up to Brahma Lok. And he goes to see Lord Brahma. And he says, please help me. The chakra is just about to get me. Lord Brahma says, Krishna, with the wink of his eye, is destroying all these universes. We are just simple, unpowerful servants of Him. We are fully surrendered to Him. I cannot, I cannot. I have no power to stop this. Keep going. Don't stay here. It's hot. And so Durvasa Muni then decided, I shall go see Lord Shiva. So he goes to Kailash. This is my dear Lord Shiva. Please help me. And Lord Shiva says, huh, huh, We have no power in front of Lord Krishna in his chakra. He goes on to say, We and the demigods and others, we are deluded thinking we are so powerful. But we are nothing in the presence of the Lord. And he begins to explain also how by just lying down, very simply desiring universes are being created and destroyed. And how they are all surrendered to Krishna. So I cannot help you. Sorry, I did not advance my picture. This is the chakra chasing Durvasa Muni. So now where Durvasa Muni was going to go? He said, everyone said, you must go to Lord Vishnu, Lord Krishna. So he goes to Vaikuntalo. And there he falls at the feet of Lord Narayan. And he performed great penances. He said, my dear Lord, please forgive me. I realize now I have offended your devotee. You can forgive anyone. Please forgive me. And the Lord said, what did he say? He said, okay. 
let's see now how what Krishna says about his devotee. This verse is a little interesting. Let's hear it. I'll read a few. It's amazing. What Krishna says when he sent the chakra, Durvasa Muni is bowing at his feet, begging for forgiveness. Krishna is the most forgiving person. In what Krishna says. He says, As chaste women bring their gentle husbands under control by service, the pure devotees who are equal to everyone and completely unattached to me in the core of their heart bring me under their full control. Shall I read it again? The pure devotee who are equal to everyone and completely attached to me in the core of the heart bring me under their full control. Krishna now is saying, I am controlled by my matpara devotee. The matpara devotee has only one desire. And that was? To please Krishna. But now Krishna has only one desire. And that is? Because if I think, my only desire is to please Krishna, my concern or question will be, what about me? Krishna is saying what he does. He then goes on to say, The pure devotee is always within the core of my heart. And I am always in the heart of the pure devotees. My devotees do not know anything else but me. And I do not know anyone else but them. See how Krishna reciprocates. When he says, Ma may come, surrender only to me. He's saying, I don't know anyone else but my devotees. And he is telling Durvasa Muni that when you try to attack Dur uh, Ambarish Maharaj, you are attacking me because I reside in the hearts of my pure devotees. And there's a commentary Srila Prabhupada gives. Then he says, O oh, Brahmana, let me now advise you for your own protection. Please hear from me. By offending Maharaj Ambarish, you have acted with self-envy. Therefore, you should go to him immediately, without a moment's delay. One so-called prowess, when employed against the devotee, certainly harms he who employs it. Thus, it is sub the subject, not the object, who is harmed. The source of the envy is harm, not the envy. So, you can see, Krishna said, I cannot release the chakra. Who can release it now? So, Durvasa Muni goes to see Ambarish Maharaj. And what does Durvasa Muni do? He falls at the feet. And what is Ambarish Maharaj now doing with his right hand? He's praying to the chakra, you please forgive this person. It was a minor offense. Don't worry. You are so great, he goes on to glorify the chakra. And the chakra goes away. Now, Durvasa Muni had interrupted Ambarish Maharaj's thing. Ambarish Maharaj waited for Durvasa Muni to return. How long he waited? One full year. A second year had elapsed since the beginning of the fast. Because he knew Durvasa Muni would come back. Now, if somebody tried to attack us and they were defeated, how we would react? And Ambarish Maharaj forgave Durvasa Muni and honored Prasadam and some further pastimes continued. So now let's analyze this pastime. 
I put a little table together. We have Durvasa Muni and Ambarish Maharaj. First, who are they? Durvasa Muni was a mystic yogi. And it was Gyanic path. But Ambarish Maharaj was? A pure devotee of the Lord. Durvasa Muni had pride. Pride that how you could take foods before me. And what was Amrish Maharaj's response? Did he debate back? Did he argue? Did he say, I'm only following this? How were you able to say, I didn't take, I just took some water? What position <laughs> Amrish Maharaj took? You mean he didn't have a big argument about it? <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't no, he was just humble about it. Oh, it's his argument. But he was just humble about it. Yeah. He was very humble about it. Who ended up with a better outcome, the prideful or the humble person? The humble person. Muni had extreme anger, born out of his pride. His pride. When I have expectations, I should be received this way, I should have that. I'm going to be disappointed, and it's going to make me angry. Do you think he was jealous? Yeah, he had self envy, right? Krishna said, You had self envy. And when there is self-envy, when there is envy, the, the, envy of, the envious person will try to harm the object of their envy. Right? But Krishna said, the object is never harmed. It is always the subject, the envious person, who is ultimately harmed. And we see this in space. So extreme anger. Ambrish Maharaj. Calm. Very stoic. Durvasa Muni, revenge. He invoked a fiery demon to revenge for taking a drop of water. Would we call that tit for tat? Did he know why he took the drop of water or no? Yeah. To not break the fast. <laughs> of course he knew, but because but he of pride. Still said it was weak. Okay. Yeah, because of pride. Ambarish Maharaj. Did he seek revenge after? Durvasa Muni tried to kill him with a fiery demon? He didn't even take prasad. He didn't say, forget him. Let me go. I'm hungry. He waited. Was forgiving even before Krishna told him to come and ask for forgiveness. Ambrish Maharaj had a very forgiving position. And Durvasa Muni's biggest mistake was what? didn't know who Ambarish Maharaj was. He mistaken him for some ordinary king and did not understand he was a pure devotee of the Lord. But Ambarish Maharaj, not a single flaw in his reaction. So we can see humble, stoic, forgiving, Perfect understanding. These are the characteristics of a Matpara devotee. So let's see some morals of the story. One, pride is very dangerous. We don't make good decisions when we are full of pride and face anger. It will always lead to ultimately our downfall. The Rasa Muni's pride was broken in a nice way. But often it is not. So pride is what brought us in separation from Krishna in the first place. We said, why you? Why not me? Why I should work for you? That is the pride that exists in our heart. And by studying these pastimes, one gets great blessings to try to purify from this pride. Another moral. A devotee of Krishna is extraordinarily powerful, yet very controlled. Ambrish Maharaj's power was, he was ruling the whole world. Yet, he was not drunk on that power, uncontrolled in his behavior. 
He was very composed. He understood that that power was given to him by Krishna. And so it should be used for Krishna. So to be humble, to be a devotee, does not mean to be weak. Amrish was, Maharaj was the most powerful person. And you can see ultimately, who was more powerful in this story? Amrish Maharaj or Durvasa Muni? Not even close. So calm, controlled, stoic, humble. Those are characteristics of strength. Not of weakness. A devotee has no fear. When that fiery demon went at Ambarish Maharaj, what was his reaction? Nothing. Would, did he not see it? Why he did not react? He wasn't scared. And why was he not scared? Because he was protected by Krishna and he knew that. He knew it. Not just could say it, he knew it. He didn't even pray, Krishna help me. Why? Because he knew that Krishna was there. Now. He didn't have to ask him. He knew. Krishna was always, he'd been there with him for his whole existence. He knew. Krishna's going to protect me if he wants to. If he wants me to die by this demon, that must be Krishna's great plan. Great, let it be. He didn't even feel the need to pray for help. Because he had the faith that Krishna was going to be there. And did Krishna let him down? Immediately his chakra came. Proof positive that even Ambarish Maharaj didn't have to ask for it. This is the position of a devotee. No fear. Because the only thing of value for a devotee is there's bhakti with Krishna that is independent of this body, of our wealth, of our assets. Whatever we may lose, we have fear of losing those things that we value. But a devotee knows, I can never lose the only thing I really value. Umbrish Maharaj considered his position as king as valuable as piles of stone. The king in the palace is always fearful of someone poisoning him. Someone trying to overtake his power. Someone attacking his kingdom. They build moats and bridges and lookouts and armies. Why? Always fearful of someone usurping their kingdom. They're never peaceful. Umbrish Maharaj was a king. But he wasn't attached to the kingdom. He was attached to Krishna. So if he was going to lose his kingdom also, no problem. He was using it as a service to Krishna. Don't fear. This is the quality of a devotee and a quality we can acquire. Offending a devotee is very dangerous. Why? Because that devotee is very dear to Krishna says, I myself cannot overcome your offense. He says, Sarva dharma prityaja maame kam sharnam braja aham tam sarve papedme. He says, Krishna says, I will deliver you from all of your sinful reactions. But there's one offense he cannot deliver you from. And that is the offense to his devotees. Like a mother will say, you can pick on me, but don't pick on my child. Krishna cannot forgive. That is the extreme mistake Durvasa Muni made. And that mistake was made because he thought he knew. Puffed up by his knowledge. His mystic yogic powers. Humility. What a powerful characteristic. When we take a humble position in everything... Never will we feel disrespected. 
If I have no expectation, amanina manadena, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, we should have no expectation for respect, but we should respect all. Powerful statement. Humility allows us to remain composed and use the intelligence we've been given to make good decisions. But full of pride, full of ego, but humility is a strength. It is not a weakness. Oh, let you run all over me. Was Maharaj Ambrish run over? No. He conquered the great Durvasa Muni. And his qualification to be very dear to Krishna, what is the one quality Krishna loves most? It is humility. Because Krishna himself has the most humble position. What position he's taking in this picture? It's the driver. He is willing to be the taxi cab driver for Arjuna. He's willing to take, this is the supreme personality of Godhead is willing to be the chauffeur in driving Arjuna's chariot. So humility is an extraordinarily important quality in our devotional service. I already spoke of detachment. We see Amrish's Maharaj's perspective. Everything I have has been given to me by Krishna. I will use it in his service, how he deems it best. No excessive attachment. And above all else, the moral of this story is how powerful love of Krishna is, bhakti. That even Krishna himself comes under the control of his devotee. He says, I come under the control of my devotee. So when a devotee says, my only goal is to please Krishna, who wins in that formula? Because whatever we can give Krishna, how does that compare to what Krishna can give us? It's not even close. It's not even close. So we can see how to develop these qualities. They almost seem impossible, right? We thought controlling the mind was difficult. But how to acquire these qualities? What was Maharaj Ambarish's qualification? It was his rendering of practical devotional service. Practicing bhakti. By the practice of bhakti, all of these qualities naturally emerge. Actually, these qualities are the original, natural characteristics of each of us as part and parcel of Krishna. Because Krishna possesses these qualities in full. Humility, tolerance, forgiveness, strength, intelligence. If we are part of Him, then we must possess them also. But they are covered. They are subdued, like that diamond covered in mud. So by the practice of bhakti, these qualities naturally emerge. We don't even have to try. Okay, let me try to become humble. Let me try to become forgiving. Let me try to become, you know, less angry. No, it is a natural byproduct of our practice of bhakti. Because these qualities are already lying dormant in us. So how to practice bhakti? A, B, C, Ds. Association. Engaging in devotional service together. In sessions like this in the temple, celebrating festivals. Reading Shastra, reading pastimes like this within Srimad Bhagavatam, inspire our faith in bhakti. Studying Bhagavad Gita as we are week after week. And I could put a big star or an asterisk behind it. If you can't do anything else, just by chanting, the purification is so profound. Even without knowledge, without Shastric evidence, if we can acquire the faith to chant, the result will manifest. 
And of course, I eat the sound. So, by the practice of bhakti, these qualities that Ambarish Maharaj possessed will manifest. And remember, they are lying dormant within all of us. There's no hope, no possibility that it can't happen. Because they are already there. We just have to bring them out. We have to uncover them by the cleansing process of bhakti. Yes? This is off the subject. I should have asked it earlier, but I didn't want to cut you off. Please. Because um, I don't want you to. I would lose my train of thought if I was doing this class. I'd be like, um, when you say chakra, what does that mean? Because I thought I yeah. understood it, and then you said it again, and I didn't. I thought it first so, meant like double. Yeah, so, so Krishna, Krishna has a Sudarshana Chakra. It's a weapon. It's a it's a fiery weapon with basically blades. Think of it like a, a buzz saw. Uh, and it, he uses it to decapitate the demon, the fiery demon. It's his weapon. So he sent his weapon. Um, it's called the Sudarshana Chakra. And that is uh, the next chapter. Ambrish um, Maharaj offers all these wonderful prayers and glorifications to this Sudarshan Chakra. But it is the weapon of Lord Vishnu. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, now Bhakti. We have a very special benefit. That starting next Wednesday is this most auspicious time of the year. It is called Damodarman or the month of Karthi. So any time of year, it is very auspicious and very potent to practice devotional service. But during this month of Damodar month, whatever we do in devotional service is multiplied many, many million times. Prabhupada used to compare it to like a giant sale. If you go into a store that's having a giant sale, with a little bit of money, you can walk out with a lot of things. Like that, Thanksgiving. <laughs> like that, this is the ultimate. With a little bit of effort and bhakti during this Kartik Mas, we can obtain huge progress in bringing out our love for Krishna. So there are some very special ways in which we'll observe this month. Starting next week, we'll offer some of these. So the first is to light a lamp. And next week I'll read from Skanda Purana and from Padma Purana and many different Shastras. The extraordinary potency of lighting one lamp. One can burn as many sins as one can acquire, uh, uh, cons uh, can generate in millions of births. One can eradicate with the lighting of a single lamp. What kind of lamp? I'll show you. Next week. It's a ghee lamp. A ghee wick. We offer a ghee lamp. We'll offer to Krishna. And by doing in that, we'll also recite this Damodar Astakam. Astakam means eight. It is the eight players of Lord Damodar that's depicted here. And you may be wondering what's going on. So we'll recite the pastime of Lord Damodar. Maybe next time we'll have Damodar Lila. Another story. Entertaining, but full of morals. Then, we can have some Kartik vows. You know, some vrata, we call it. You know, I'm going to chant extra round a day. I'm going to, you know, give up one of my hankerings during this month. You know, I'm going to read one page of Bhagavad Gita every day. Some vow that you take. And if you fulfill it from beginning to end of the month, it is very, very auspicious and very, very powerful. So, and the best of all ways is extra chanting. And this month, it is very, very powerful. So it is from October 24th to November 22nd. It starts next Wednesday. And we'll be discussing many things about this Kartik Mass over the next four weeks. Uh, and celebrating in very, many, very ways. And then this Sunday is another festival of... Dashera, which is the beheading, the conquering of Ravana by Lord Ram. And we'll discuss um, in the Sunday Bhakti Vaksha about the meaning 
behind this whole thing. Again, not just a story of drama or good over evil. It is very instructive. What the ten heads of Ravan represent. And why, when Lord Ram is shooting arrows, when one head falls off, another one comes back. What that represents, our Acharyas explained to us. And by hearing this pastime, we'll see how to destroy some of the Ravan-like tendencies within all of us. So, please. What's an example of one of those tendencies? Lust. Greed, anger, pride, illusion. So how people are, you mean? All the characteristics of people. All of them. Exactly. Exactly. We're all mini Ravanas walking around. <laughs> oh my god. Mini Ravanas without head. But thankfully, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came with the weapon of not an arrow. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came with the weapon of the holy name. By chanting the holy name, we'll behead all of these impurities within our heart with the sweet lotus-like sounds of the holy names. Any questions, comments? Are we going to talk about the grain fast? Yes. We can talk about the grain fast. So... The grain fast is called Ekadashi. It happens um, on the 11th day of the lunar cycle. So it's on a lunar calendar. So the day of the week, it shifts. And this week, it is coming on Saturday. So the way we observe the grain fast is starting the night before at around 10 o'clock, we stop eating any grains. And there are some subtle forms of grains we, not, we may not be so familiar with. There are obvious forms of grain, rice, wheat, flour, any kind of legumes or beans, uh, chickpeas, things like that are all considered grains. Um, and so that day of Saturday will abstain from grains. So what can you eat? You can eat fruits, milk, like things like quinoa, uh, there's What's tapioca. Quinoa? quinoa is a, a root. It's a root. I've never heard of that yeah. Oh, you haven't eaten early quinoa? Oh my god. Never. You like a health person too. And you know I love food. Yeah. Oh, quinoa. 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 Yeah. Quinoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I know I'm you're going to quinoa. They like, serve quinoa, it like. Because I was thinking, quinoa. okay, okay. So quinoa. I'm sorry. You can eat quinoa. milk, quinoa, and um, fruits, fruits, nuts, nuts yogurt. Yeah, most vegetables you can eat, like a, like a salad, lettuce. Uh, some people are a little bit, you know, there's different variations. Some people won't eat vegetables with lots of seeds, but that's, I wouldn't worry about that right now. So there's some minor leaves, but yeah, you can eat things like that. Yeah, you cannot eat those. <laughs> you cannot eat those. But you can eat samo. Samo is a type of upma that we make. That's a spirit. So there's some, you know, kind of specific foods that uh, you eat. And the main thing on Egadashi is that we do some additional service, some additional chanting, reading. And there are two Ekadashis during Kartik that I am going to beg all of us, please follow. Because the Ekadashis during Kartik are extraordinarily powerful. They're all powerful, but there's extraordinary power in the Ekadashis during Kartik. And that's next month, right? Or yeah, starting. that's next month, yep. But the, yeah, the next Ekadashi will be Saturday, and then the next will be about 14 to 15 days later. So every 14 or 15 days, this Ekadashi comes. So two times ago, when we had Bhakti Viksha here, we had Ekadashi. And all of the prasad everyone ate was grain-free. So you can eat, and you almost won't even realize it. And if you have any trouble cooking, you can ask some of the Mataji's to help. So when does it end? It ends uh, the next m morning. So the eighth day now, after Ekadashi called Dwadi, there's a specific time in which it ends. That was the thing that Ambarish Maharaj was trying to observe. So there's a window, you know, like 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. It might be 7.02 to, you know, 11.07. Just take some grain in between that time. So each, and on the calendars we have, it, it gives the next day when to break the fast. So that's when it ends. So it starts. And if you don't do that, then the whole thing just it doesn't count. It is considered 
you know, completion of the group. Krishna will always look at what we do. So, but we should try to observe the Dvadashi breaking. If there are practical limitations, sometimes you'll forget. You know, sometimes like, you know, practically my kids go to school, so I have to eat breakfast. Not so militant on it. But if we can follow it, it's very good. And one bite of grain is good enough, and then you can move yes. your... Yeah, exactly. You can just even take a, you know, yeah, a quick, quick pan. Yeah, no. Just some grain will break. Because even one small grain can break the fast on the day of also. So, but there's also what we call nirjala. So if we were not, if we we're unable to observe some ekadashis, maybe you accidentally broke them, then on once a year in May and June, May or June, there's a nirjala, and there we fast from everything, water and everything, and if you follow that, all of the ekadashis during the year where you may have made some small mistakes here and there become upset. And that, the no water thing, is that a 24 hour period? Or? Yeah, it's a little bit intense. So you have to prepare for it. There's some way, when it comes close, we'll talk about how to prepare for it. Can you eat gum? No. <laughs> but don't worry. Krishna will help you. That's the cheating, right? That's the only way. I'm like the bad student in the class. That's the only way it will happen is if Krishna helps you. So it's a very important uh, part of our devotion. So it's one of the few austerities we have. If you think, we feast, we sing, we dance, we talk story. Ekadashi is one of the few austerities that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu really recommended we follow. We don't have to, like, do it. Do we have to do anything before we start it or start it, do it? Start it, yeah. Nothing, just, nothing too fancy. Yeah, so after, uh, yeah, go ahead, Prabhu. Uh, after Krishna Avatara, what are the next two Avataras of Krishna? Well, his very next Avatar, after Krishna comes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came you know, 500 years ago. And after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, at the end of Kali Yuga will come Kalki Avatar. Okay, Kalki Avatar. Will come and he will finish up all the living entities and then come back to Sakya Yuga. And then the Yuga cycles will continue again. So, how far away is it? 427,000 years. So, Kali Yuga is 432,000 years in duration. We are about 5,000, a little bit over 5,000 years have elapsed. So roughly like 427,000 years are left until such a time. Do you have a question? Uh, here, uh, to understand who is devotee, uh, in Purvasamuni, even with all mystic progress, he was not able to understand uh, who is devotee. So uh, how can the ordinary person mm -hmm. understand? Mm -hmm. Well, because usually devotees they don't show out so yeah. it's all inside mind conscious. <laughs> yeah, how good. So the question is if Durvasa Muni could not see that Ambrish Maharaj is devotee, how an ordinary person can see. So you know Mahatma sees everyone as a devotee and does not discriminate. So our position is, uh, the, one of the characteristics and qualities of the devotee is they treat everyone with respect. Because they see Krishna part and parcel residing within each and every living entity. So we don't judge this person devotee, this person not devotee, this person devotee, this person not devotee. We don't know. All we know is this person, out of humility, wow, they're much more devotee than I am. I have no devotional qualification. But if we judge, oh, this person's an advanced devotee based on X, Y, and Z, unless you're in a managerial position where we, we, you're required to make such judgments, it's better you don't. And you shouldn't judge animals either, right? Absolutely. They're living entities. They're part and parcel of And they can be devotees too, right? They can become future devotees. They cannot... It's, 
very rare, it's very, in some instances it's happened, surely rare for them to be able to practice devotion because of their consciousness. But by feeding animals facade, we can bring them back to their original devotional consciousness. Maybe not in that life, but certainly in the next life. So we should be very loving and compassionate to all living entities, not just humans, not just those who like us, who are, who are, or who are like us. So to understand the definition of humility, I always like to have confusion. So it's not patience, it's not tolerance, it's not uh, um, not reacting immediately. It is something we take a lower, like we feel we take a lower position than others. We feel uh, so. I don't know. You can what is humility? Yeah, the definition. So humility is this. Not thinking you're better than someone else. To some degree. But I'll give a more precise definition of what Srila Prabhupada is. Humility means to have an accurate understanding of who we are. Everybody! Not to overstate it and not to understate it. To have an ex accurate understanding of who I am. That's humility. And who am I? I am an infinitesimal tiny spark of Krishna as is part and parcel with no independent existence I cannot even take one breath without the mercy of Krishna my existence tomorrow is only by the mercy of Krishna the ability I have is by the mercy of Krishna the position I have is by the mercy of So to understand exactly who am I accurately, that is humility. So it's not to think that I am weak, or that I am fallen, or that I cannot do this and I cannot do that. You can to say, I am extraordinary because I am an infinitesimal tiny spark of someone who is extraordinary, Krishna. That's humility. So it is not about feeling weak. That's not humility. Humility is having confidence. Utsaha nischaya dharya. Rupa Goswami says you must be confident to be successful in bhakti. Well, how can you can be confident in humility? That no, confident. But confident in Krishna, not yourself. He said you should be confident in two things. One, the path of Krishna consciousness is the only means for my happiness. Confident there, and confident too, that Krishna's mercy is the only way I'll have success. So devotees are confident. Ambarish Maharaj was extraordinarily confident that if Krishna wanted to protect him, he would protect him, and if he didn't, he didn't. He didn't lack any confidence, because if he wasn't confident, he would say, Krishna, help! But he had full confidence, he didn't need to ask. Krishna was there, so he was confident. But he was humble. And humble is the, humility is the ingredient of Krishna Prema, love of God. You cannot have love of Krishna without humility. Like, you cannot have fire without heat. There, again. You cannot have love of Krishna without humility. But humility is not weakness. It is not that I am, you know, just fallen into... I am Krishna's tiny, infinitesimal spark. And humility is followed by all good qualities like patience, tolerance, and um, whatever all the good qualities are there. Uh, um, can you say that again? Like the good qualities like patience, tolerance, and um, thought reacting immediately. So all this are followed 
That if you are more humble than a blade of grass, if you are more tolerant than a tree, and you offer respects to all, and expect no respect for yourself, you can kirtaniya sadahari, chant the holy names constantly. So, by chanting constantly, all these qualities will come. Right? So, you can say that humility will lead to other qualities. But humility, if it's not generated from bhakti, will not generate all these qualities. So, one can be humble in a non-spiritual sense. Right? So, you see humility in the world. Certain leaders are humble. There was just an article in the Wall Street Journal this weekend talking about humble CEOs and how many people hate their bosses. But one of the characteristics that leaders are trying to develop is humility and how that's an attractive characteristic to employees that inspire them to do great work. Right? So you can be humble in that sense. But that won't necessarily lead, yield any benefit until it begins dovetailed into Krishna's service. So all of these qualities automatically come by our practice of bhakti. And we should become aware of them and practice how to be humble. And it's not about speaking humbly. Humbleness is here and here. I can speak, oh, I'm your humble servant. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you are such a rascal. <laughs> then what's the point? Right? So, it, it is not about speaking humble. It is about being humble. And humility will come by the practice of bhakti. But we must be conscious to cultivate humility. Ambrish Maharaj, remember, powerful, dynamic, ruler, family man, but extraordinary. And now, today's leaders are starting to see the power of humility. But the great kings, all in Srimad Bhagavatam, they are all humble leaders. Yudhishthira Maharaj. Yeah. All the great leaders, they are all humble. So like this is kind of confusing to me. So, so how is actually our past karmas are connected to each results that we face on a daily basis or on, a, mm -hmm. on whatever situation it is? Because there are times where if, if some something bad happens, we, we want to take it like okay, it's good for me because it's Krishna's plan, but. If I have not done anything on that, and then just keep, use Krishna as a, you know. Well, what do you mean if you have not done anything on that? Like, maybe I didn't take any steps to achieve that, or like. So you're yeah. saying that bad action that came to you mm -hmm. was unjust. Oh, yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, well, then what you are implying is that Krishna made a mistake. Because if something happens to you that's not in proportion to something you did previously, then that means a mistake happened. Krishna is the supreme controller. If I'm sent to jail for a crime I didn't commit, that's a mistake. That's injustice. Right? Okay. So a devotee knows there is no such thing as injustice. Because if there were, it would mean Krishna is not the perfect administrator of the karma system. So, I may not know what I did to deserve this reaction, but what I did is irrelevant. What I know is I did something. Whether I can remember or not, I don't know. Because Krishna never gives too much or too little. He gives only an exacting proportion. So there's no scope for that to be a mistake. 
Because if it were a mistake, then you could throw the whole system out. Because then how do you know what's your just karma and what's unjust? So every action, we do millions and millions of actions at every day. We're not keeping a law. But Krishna and his agents are. Not just for this lifetime, but for many hundreds, millions of lifetimes. So rest assured, whatever happens to you, good or bad. Not, well, I'll just rely on Krishna because maybe this is... No. Now a devotee sees that whatever bad is happening to me, Krishna is minimizing. I deserve more, but he is minimizing because he's so sweet and nice to me. And when something good happens, a devotee says, Krishna is being overly kind. I don't deserve this, but he is giving. But our approach is exact opposite. When something good happens, I did it. And when something bad happens, Krishna did it. But a devotee is the opposite. When something bad happens, oh, I did so much more, but Krishna is lessening. And when something good happens, Krishna did it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this situation, though, like, like, for example, I'm suffering from some health, in this is cancer. Okay. So, there could be two. One, there are people who smokes whatever, but they still don't get that. But there are people who would have not done, who would have done that bad practice, but mm -hmm. they would have got it. Mm -hmm. So in both the situations, should I say my karma is a resultant of this? Or? Yeah, re, 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 you remember back to the seminar, the grain silos. Mm -hmm. So remember one thing, karma, Sometimes the reactions are fast. Sometimes they are, take very long time. But the reactions are coming. So I'll tell the story of the grain silo. There's, you know, and there was the one lady who has faced so many difficulties in her life. But her whole life, she was so pious. Never ever gave harm to anybody. Never upset anybody. Always went out of her way to help everyone. Yet... Her whole life, setback after setback after setback. And she was thinking, what I did to deserve this? And so the story of the grain silo sounds like this. So there's a farmer, and he is cultivating the fields one year. And he's putting very nice water, nice fertilizer, cultivating at the perfect time. Very high quality crop comes. So he puts it into the storehouse, the grain silo. One third filled that way. The second year... He's cultivating, but not so good water, not as much fertilizer. He's cultivating a little bit late. So some medium quality crop comes. And he fills the second, third with medium quality crop. Last year, very bad rains, no fertilizer. Almost on a verge of spoiling, he harvested. Very late. And he puts a bad quality crop in the sun. Now the child goes and pulls some grains. What comes out? Good quality crop. But he's saying, Father is putting bad quality crops in. So he, he's telling, Father, wow, this machine is amazing. You're putting bad in, and good is coming out. And, and Father says, oh, hey, You don't know. You saw this year I'm putting good bad in. But three years ago I put good in, so you're getting that. But the bad I put in this year, that will also come eventually. So we may see I'm doing all these good actions, but bad reactions are coming. How? Because we don't see the bad actions we did previously. Or conversely, hey, this person is doing all nonsense, yet only getting good. Just like that child. Bad grains are going in, they're only seeing good grains. But remember, whatever goes in that silo must come out. Whatever actions we do, those reactions are coming. So just because someone is smoking and not getting cancer today, we don't know next lifetime. We don't know three lifetimes from now. We don't know. So don't be inspired that somebody is doing nonsense, our neighbor is doing nonsense, they're getting all the promotions and BMWs and nice things. 
Don't worry. They're putting bad grades in their silo also. Those times will come. What they're getting, promotions, BMWs, this, is the result of some prior good action. Because good action equals good reaction. Bad action equals bad reaction. No breaking that formula. Good doesn't offset bad. I did bad last night, let me go to the temple today and do some good. To cancel out. No. Good equals good, bad equals bad. When you put it in a grain silo, the bad reaction uh, grains don't get consumed by the good grains. They will both come out. So every grain of reaction must come out until you take the buck view. Then he says, I'll empty your grain silo if you surrender unto me. So everything you're seeing is a function of that. And if someone's reactions are not coming now, don't worry, they're coming. Don't worry, those bad grains are going to come out of that silo. This is why bad things happen to good people and why good things happen to bad people. When bad things happen to good people, we become disturbed. We become shaken in our faith of Krishna. How we can let this happen? But remember, Krishna is only administering what's in the silo. Whatever actions we put in, that's what's coming out. Not one ounce more, not one ounce less. Until one becomes his devotee. Then he takes special care. Otherwise he is neutral. Unbiased. Okay? But digesting that uh, bad things will be difficult. <laughs> like, it is easy to digest a good one, but when bad things happen, immediately what will strike us? Oh, we are doing so much good, then why is only this is happening to us? That, that will come and digesting will take time, you know? No, digesting good is harder. You know why? Because digesting good, we think, I did it. That's easier to digest. <laughs> but it's harder to renounce that the good is actually Krishna's doing. The ability we have is coming from Krishna. But yes, digesting this is difficult. But you see, Amrish Maharaj, when the fiery demon attacked him, did he think, Krishna, I did no karma. What bad action I did to deserve to be killed by this fiery demon? I was just taking water. I did a vrata for one year. I'm a pious king. Did he do his whole analysis? No. Krishna, I'm yours. Good, bad, or indifferent? Yes, it's difficult. But by the strength of bhakti, lifting that vehicle is difficult. But with the right equipment, it's very easy. So these... This consciousness, yeah, it's very difficult, but it is very easy to achieve with bhakti. But even when the bad happens, we also get disturbed mentally, and that will lead to some unwanted things, no? So what bad happens? Hold on. How do we control that? No, bad happens. There is no duality for it. Now you tell me what bad happens. I lose my job. Is that bad? How is that bad for my soul? Whatever bad happens, ask, how is it bad for my soul? But then, if we have to lead the life, that is also required now, Prabhupada. Okay. Uh, we need job, we need everything else. You need job? <laughs> so the, the, the uh, ants and birds, they need job, they need Costco membership to buy food? Who's providing them food? Who's providing? Nate Krishna. So Krishna is providing food to the ants and to the squirrels and to the He won't provide to us? Of course he will. So I lose my job. How is it bad for my soul? Someone dies. Sad. Difficult, right? How is it bad for my soul? My car is total in a car accident. Is it bad for my... Everything bad, just look through this lens. How is it bad for my soul? Then we'll be able to make sense of it. If we try to make sense of it by what karma I did, why Krishna did this, that formula we can never understand. 
But the formula we can understand is, I am spirit soul. Amrish Maharaj was not concerned about his body being destroyed by the fiery demon. Why? He knew, I am spirit soul. If Krishna doesn't want me to be in this body, fine. I've had millions of bodies, I'll get another one. What's the big deal? The big deal is, we have attachment to this body. I want this body, and I want all the relationships with this body. Like, uh, that is with respect to material body. Like, say, if we are not well. That time we start feeling bad, no? like, oh, I'm not feeling well, I cannot go and do anything. So, it's like somewhat handicapped. So, how do we take that situation? Yeah. So, your body is not feeling well. You think, wow, Krishna, you are so kind. You are giving me a reminder that this body is also an important vehicle to serve you. I am very grateful for the opportunity to serve you. In my ill health, I am not able to serve. I wish to become more sincere when I am well to serve you. How about that? It's okay? Yeah. Feels good? Yeah. Actually, it feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. When you say that, that Krishna, thank you for giving me this illness, because had I not gotten this illness, I would be taking for granted all the things you are giving me to allow me to serve you. Thank you for this gentle yeah. reminder that you have given me pneumonia. Thank you. You are very kind to me. Not jokingly, sincerely. Because those moments of distress bring us closer to understanding how Krishna is maintaining us all along the way. So, when we find difficulties, that's why association is important. Right? We, ah, how can I look at this situation? I'm not able to decipher. But look at it through this lens. I am spirit soul. Why is this situation bad for my soul? When I look at it from that perspective, I'll find good answers. But remember, detaching from this body isn't going to happen overnight. Yeah. Right? But we know at least where we need to go. So start by talking ourselves through it. When bad things come, but also I encourage you when good things come. Evaluate the good things by also. How is this good for my soul? You know? When the big project is completed successfully, oh, something good happens. How is that good for my soul? You know? Some relationship with some person is now very nice. How is that good for my soul? That relationship sours and becomes very bad. How is that bad for my soul? If we ask that question, we'll be able to get through those initial reactions. The initial reactions are going to happen because our instincts are still changing. It's okay. But after the instincts, then put the glasses on. And ask these questions. Okay. Yeah. Everyone must be scared now. To ask <laughs> I think in, in one of the Prabhupada lectures, also the same thing he said. Mm. Like what Mother Diaz, if if animals can have their food every day. There is no doubt that you will definitely have your food without any. Thing. We need very little. We should have that faith too. That's it. Yeah. Another one will take and surrender. That, that surrender. Amrish Maharaj was not even praying. Think about our position at that point. If we are lucky, we would pray to Krishna. More than likely, we would run, fight, do something. If we are lucky, we would pray to Krishna. But, Amrish Maharaj? There is grades of surrender also there too. Yeah. We are in the beginning stages of surrender. But we must continue to graduate by studying these times. We see how to become inspired to surrender more. And don't let the ocean of up and down throw you around. Remember, Elevate, transcend, get above. Anytime we are 
up and down, it means I am having body consciousness. I am something attaching to the body. As soon as there's ups and downs, alarm bell, ring, 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 body, 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 kind of, should come off. As soon as that is there, even in bhakti, oh, I'm not feeling so enthusiastic today to do my service. There's some bodily attachment in that service time. So that alarm bell should go off. Okay, now let me think. What am I? Okay. okay. That's how we gain strength. To be like Ambarish Maharaj. To face those difficulties. It's not theoretical. Many of you are smiling like, oh boy, this will never happen for me. <laughs> it will happen. It absolutely will happen with the application of the processes of bhakti. It absolutely will happen. Why I can say so confident? We truly happened for millions of lifetimes. Everyone, so many people have experienced it. Why not us? Why not us? It can happen. It will happen. But the question is, am I willing my way to chant, to leave? to render service in the temple. Am I determined? I have to be determined to achieve the result. Shall we chant? Yeah. Is it too late? No, it's okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> if anybody needs to take the side, you can take. Uh, it's too late. Some comments.